Wow, you like that, huh? <laughs> JG playlist, I knew you were badass. I didn't know you were dope in the, in the music game too, man. Oh yeah, man, love it, love it. I've uh, been a fan of, uh, you know, music my whole life, but it's um, this, the, the way the, the tech is right now, your access to music, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it wasn't so accessible. So I love how it's, it's just easy to get these days. Well, and a lot of people in the industry with Pandora, this carefully curated playlist, I looked at it. And um, I think music's like wine. It, it shows a little bit of who you are, correct? 100%. 100%. Yeah. yeah. How so are you? I'm doing good. Gracias a Dios. But I will tell you this. Thank you for getting on here. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to cook because I'm going to be hungry interviewing some questions. Sure. I, I was in the mood for ceviche, so... Um, there you go. <laughs> I got it from here. Oh, nice, nice, nice. I got, I got it. All the ingredients puree into some camarón. But while I start prepping that, tell us what you've been up to. I got uh, an update on JCB. I've got, um, you know, being able to talk to you as far as where you're shifting, where the industry is going. What have you been up to? Yeah, so I've been, um, yesterday we launched uh, my personal brand site. So chef Jose Gar or chef yep, yep. Uh, which has really been exciting. That's, that's been something that's probably been on my mind for about five or ten, five years or so. And with the shift with, you know, with the pandemic kind of taking hold this spring, it was just a good opportunity for me to really focus on that. And what is, you know, you know, previous, you know, as a, as a restaurateur, as an operator, you do have a lot of time that's really focused on your employees, on your offerings, on, you know, operations. And so, again, this time has, has you know, it's been one of the silver linings. It's allowed me to, like, focus, okay, on other aspects of F&B, other aspects of um, what's out there in industry. So, with the site, it really represents all the ways I'm thinking about food and, and things that are fun, things that I, that I want to do, that I want to get into. Um, and so, yeah, and then a few of them are, yeah, I could hit on them. Um, it, it's, it's really real, well-rounded um, on that website because, of course, they see you as, you know, a big restaurateur, the first Iron Chef that happens to be Latino. And now this is a more personal, Jose. And I think those were people... People always saw you execute on a high level on certain, you know, in the extra execution of plates, but now this is more you, more accessible, more reaching out. Um, so it wasn't really a discomfort for you. It's just being who you are, correct? 100%. Yeah, no, this is really, this is under the covers. This is under the hood. This is what you're getting. So you, you discovered today that I like music that, you know, that, oh, I'm into music. Yeah, I didn't, you didn't know that. And so that's not, that's, just, not just music, but good music, you oh. know? <laughs> thank you thank you yeah so that's really you know i think you really personified it really really nicely and really getting to know me and really not even get like me being able to reach out and, and touch people so through um on on the digital content side so we we filmed 24 we started a, basically a web series a 24 part web series called cooking space uh -huh. and this is where um mindfulness and being present meets food and music so they're eight to ten minute uh long pieces that um there will be a, a recipe that's accompanied the the video and it'll be on my youtube channel chef jose garza so we'll start airing those we'll have two every month and so and we've got a year's worth of content so we'll have yeah. a year's worth of releases and then uh, yeah, what I like about it, this is, it's not limited to Latin food. It's really, it's all, all, all different cuisines, just kind of things that, uh, inspire me, but it really, you know, during this time when people are at home and cooking, I just, I felt like, wow, this is a great way to, you know, connect. It's key, um, it's key that you say that because you are, you grew up where, where did you grow up here? Right. You grew up in Philly? Grew up in uh, Chicago. Yeah, grew you grew up in Chicago. For yeah. Years. You grew up in Chicago. I grew up in the Bay Area. Of course, we're going to eat different culinary. So it's not like we only cook what we personify uh, publicly, right? Like, oh, oh, so real quick, can you take a look at that? Oh, wow. Look at that. Nice. It's got the same <laughs> consistency because I looked at your picture. 
it's got the same consistency to coat the shrimp, yet still taste the citrus. I got the heat. I don't have cilantro aguacate, but I have my Arrow Garden kind of chives. Um, oh, nice. But look Perfect. at it. This is you. Um, so I feel good. So let me it's ask you that. Nice. <laughs> well, it's easy, it's easy when you have a book and a picture not to fuck it up, right? Um, <laughs> my next question is, wh where do you want to be in the next two or three years? Because there is a big opportunity that's come from this pandemic uh, in the food industry. Well, I think um, there's a couple other focuses. So we talked about just the content creation. I'm uh, also, you know, we've talked about this, but on my site, there's Latin Live. And that's where I'm really focusing on Latin culture. You know, I feel like I've, I've always wanted, I've always felt like the, um, the Latin ambassador. And this, this is a way, what I love about the, the you know, current technology is that you can reach people from all over the country, all over the world. And so that's a, a two part, uh, you know, again, another way to continue to connect with people. So that, that's that, that's the digital and virtual cooking side of things. Um, I find that there's gonna be uh, an opportunity for digital brands going forward, not, you know, non brick and mortar, uh, ghost kitchens, cloud kitchens. I actually have two brands that are in development right now that I'm really excited about. Um, can't tell you what they are, but they're, 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 they'll be like right on. And, and that's for the ghost and digital side. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I think really, you know, those are, I would say like my primary focuses. And yeah, I think that yeah. you're a triple threat. You can cook mm -hmm. like there's no tomorrow. You're on TV. And you're also a mentor. So really, if you think about it, <clears throat> master classes, you know, if you look at the majority of labor force in the culinary world, it is people of color. And they feel more comfortable when there's someone like you that looks like them, yeah. but has executed on a high level. So I always tell people, don't underestimate mentorship or success. And it's even better when it looks like you, you know. And so I'm really excited for that. What, what have... Um, you know, you've done a lot for such a young age. What is, um, what were some of the big, what was a, a mistake that you made back then that you would tell a younger Jose um, that they can avoid? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many uh, pitfalls in this industry. You really have to, you have to be careful. Uh, you have to, I would say, um, really work on your plan and your strategy spend more time on that and then go into execution as opposed to letting the excitement of either being a, you know, a young talented chef or, or an ambitious restaurateur really think about the plan uh, for some time. You know, the, the site that we just launched, this has been circulating in my brain and on paper for several years before it actually, you know, became a reality. So really thinking about those things and then just, be aware of, you know, not over, not overreaching, not overstretching your capabilities or your resources, because that can get you into trouble as well. I can certainly attest to that. And, uh, and then just have some humility going forward with, with, with all of this is, you know, be humble and give back when you can. Let me ask you this. You, you, you're saying that because it's, um, you have a little different ability to shift given all your accomplishments. Let's talk 20 years ago. What was uh, what inspired you to cook? I read the book, um, but what inspired you to cook? And the next question was, when was that first aha moment that you yeah. knew that your hard work was paying off? Yeah, so my my story is is interesting in that I didn't know that I had a um, like a talent. It was a it was a discovery that occurred for me. And you know, to be honest. My mom and my grandma, they were great cooks. They're, they're, they're in the book. And I ate in the kitchen and I helped them. But yeah. we didn't have any like restaurant, like family heritage or, you know, people in the business, you know, to really provide some t tutelage. Um, I went to, went to undergrad, was not really, I was not really drawn to any particular subject or thing that, you know, really, you know, I wanted to get into. I ended up going to uh, culinary school in Chicago. Okay. That's, 
And that's where, you know, at one point, uh, you know, some of our chef assignments were like mystery baskets or like, here's a batch of ingredients, here's a recipe. And, you know, I started to realize amongst just in that small group that I was able to put things together, put flavors together, like, and it was a discovery at like 21, you know, 20, 21. What, what, what was that discovery dish? Because you're Ecuadorian, you're growing up in Chicago. And by the way, you see I'm an OG eating the ceviche with chopstick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was that breakthrough dish? Because you're, you're putting things together. What was that one signature you said, you know what? This is it. This is helping me uh, get. Well, I think, I think for me it was, it wasn't a signature dish. It was more like we had to make sol munier for our French culinary class. And I just was able to like, break down my fish, make my sauce pretty quickly, have it be tasty. Like all the, like I had, I noticed I all of a sudden became a perfectionist and as it related to, to the food and the mise en place. And so it was just more of this moment of like, wow, I actually, I actually have a talent. I can actually do this and I can probably, I can excel because I'm looking around the room and uh, my stuff looks better. And then as we got, as we got, like, I would say like more challenges and more uh, creative challenges, I also realized, wow, I have, I have a, I really, again, I had to pinch myself. I have a, this is a talent. I didn't even know I had that. So it was yeah. a discovery. So. so after culinary school, it's French theme. It's the basics. It's like the Mecca. It's like going to Harvard. What was, um, you now have to kind of go with what you want to be focusing on. Was it Latin cuisine? No, it was um, just, I, I knew that I wanted to put some time in as a, as a cook mm -hmm. and I wanted to like really get, get that ground, uh, just that foundation of like good cooking skills. And I initially wanted to go to France. I, when I finished school, I was, uh, a lot of the curriculum was French classical curriculum. So I was pretty inspired by the cooking of France. And even during that time in Chicago in the early nineties, there were, uh, the, the fine dining scene was dominated by French cuisine. It was like, yeah. that was the, the thing. And so I wanted to go to France and um, I was unable, uh, well, I, not that I was unable, I decided to go to Spain because I, I didn't know French, I knew Spanish. Yeah. And I had a, a friend of mine who had a, who knew a priest in um, Sevilla and Madrid. He had three restaurants, La Taberna del Alabardero. And uh, I was able to get basically like a, gosh, uh, I went to Spain, I worked there, room and board. And that's basically it. And I just learned how to cook uh, Spanish cuisine, Spanish culture, it was like, like a, a process. After that, I came to New York and I was still in this mindset, like, okay, I'm going to keep cooking. I'm going to keep like learning my trade. Learning, learning. And, yeah. I, and I think that's really an important lesson for, for kids and people coming up right now is that you have to put the time in. You know, I didn't become an iron chef overnight. It was really a lot of like hard nights. I'll tell you a, a quick story. So when I got to New York, my first job, I took a Zagat guide. And I looked at all the restaurants that had an over 27, 27 or 28. I'm like, okay, these guys know what they're doing in the food department. Yeah. And uh, I ended up going to the rainbow room where there was a chef there called Waldi Maloof. So famous, famous restaurant, iconic New York restaurant, great New York chef. And I'll tell you what, like these guys were busy. They were like, they would do 300 covers pre-theater. So from 4.30, to 6 30 300 covers then dinner was another 300 covers and then they had this crazy shift called supper which was yeah. so i mean armando i'm telling you i was after the end of pre-theater my whole uniform was soaked from sweat yeah. i had to change it and then keep cooking again and so yeah it really you know was a journey so five years in new york literally learning about uh different cuisines, learning from other chefs, starting to think about, okay, if I had my own company or my own restaurant, how would I run it? What's the culture? So, so, so you were, how long were you a cook in the industry, working the suppers, the New York circuit, before you said, I'm going to strive to have my own restaurant? Yeah, about 10 years. 
And I consider, yeah, I consider my culinary education, my time in Spain, my time in New York as all like apprenticeships before I felt like, you know, okay, like I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to own my own place. I'm ready to do this on my own. Yeah. Uh, and I knew, and it just, it was something, it was a feeling that just, um, came over me. I don't know. I, I, at a certain point, I'm like, okay, I've been doing this for this person. And I think what really helped me honestly was in the, I worked for the star organization when I got to Philly, I got here in 2000 and I worked for Steven for four years and he, he grew from uh, one restaurant to when I was here to 13 in Philadelphia. And so I opened two of those places with him and I loved that, uh, he was not only, you know, someone who was uh, really looking to create a great environment and create a, a great food product, but also at working for him, you understand the business side of it. Kind of, you know, P and L's every 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 month, P and L reviews along with weekly financial reportings and metrics. So that experience, along with kind of the food side of things, really helped me, perpetuate me to like, okay, because, I can. Because what you just talked about that they don't teach you that always in culinary school, correct? Uh, is, you don't, there a business, is there a business school for people in, in food? There is, I mean, I think, I think that the culinary schools have, have expanded since I went to school and really expanded their offerings. There are like BAs in uh, hospitality management as well as other business courses. So I think it's available now, but it now, wasn't as available to me before. Let me ask you this, let me ask you this, because there are a lot of passionate cooks, a lot of talent out there and they usually can go into the majority of mom and pops. You said, I want to go into a restaurant. Or you got recruited by a restaurant group or you went into the big business. I mean, you didn't open up a small, you know, mom and pop. You were thrust into that. Um, there's a, talk to us a little about that experience. Yeah. So uh, in working with, with Steve uh, and the star group, they you know, the restaurants that I oversaw for them were over 150 seats, you know, each one. And so I, that was like a comfort zone that I felt with. And so I, I felt good about that. And so I was never um, really scared of that because I, I saw what 150 seats could generate. And in our restaurant model, in our casual dining restaurant model, that's a pretty nice sweet spot to be in if you can do the turns. So it was more about betting on my ability to turn tables versus, you know, going a safer route with the smaller space, you know, mm -hmm. called like 50 or 60 seats. Because I also, again, in, in my experiences with Star, I saw that, you know, if I could turn my tables two or three times, like it really generates a, a nice profit at the end. And that's really, a, you know, at the end of the day, we're as cooks, as chefs, it's hard work, whether you're sure. doing or like 50 or like 200 people talking. yeah and, and part of that ability to create the turns and covers is your creativity and then execution where where do you credit your creativity because i've been to amada to distrito to mercado la plancha and it's always a different dish ridiculously well executed and what i like is when i go to a restaurant from like you or my other mentors is i walk away with learning something new every time and so where did that creativity come from you your travels and you just I mean look at your musical playlist it kind of shows you're not a dud right so it would where did that creativity come and you just you at you and, and a lot of the new Latino or the Latino chefs out there elevated our food but it wasn't traditional you guys use flavors of Latin America and just executed on a high level white linen you know uh, upper upper scale what was that inspiration yeah so you know initially um, as you're aware of, I work with, with Douglas Rodriguez and goes back to New York. Um, so I had been on this cook's journey and even to the point where I actually had a, I had a fail. I, I worked at a restaurant called Boulevard that was an Argentinian steakhouse and a Peruvian uh, ceviche uh, concept way ahead of its time. And it was, it was in Manhattan. And I was actually probably too young in a management position. So I actually, I screwed it up. I, my product wasn't consistent. The staff didn't like respect what I was saying or doing. I was just an up and coming guy, but I didn't do the job correctly. And because of that, 
the customer base, you know, started to feel that it was a huge learning experience for me. I was, I was really, I was devastated by that. And so during that time I went to Douglas had just opened, I was a fan of his, he was a chef of Patria, you know, his, you know, his really big standout uh, career moment in, in my opinion. And he was opening Chicama, which was a South American. In the city Chiria, yeah. Chiria. And he was, um, and then we opened, uh, uh, what's the a Spanish place? Gosh. Um, we opened a Spanish tapas bar as well in the ABC Carbon Home Building. Uh, the name, the name escapes me, but um, shoot. Um, we, I think it, it changed pretty quickly, but anyway, working with Douglas during those years, those formative, like creative, like food years, I would say, was an amazing uh, experience for me because this guy's palate and his ability to create and his passion was infectious. So I got inspired by his um, creativity and his just ability to recreate things. Like we would what, travel. What was, uh, what was one of your memorable dishes that he created that you loved? Oh, uh, well, I think, you know, when I got to Chicama and I hadn't been in his tree of like other like Latin chefs that he had. So I hadn't been at Patria and I hadn't been at Yucca in Miami. I didn't, you know, it was just kind of new coming into the scene. So I would read about his flavors, but going in and actually cooking them and like, I was just totally blown away. So one like his, all of his ceviches were, were highly creative. So he had one called, uh, I don't know if you remember, it was called the Viagra ceviche. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, he had the black squid ink sauce, um, all the different textures that, he, you know, he was doing back then, the crunchy things, the um, different sauce bases, all just like, you know, a true study in Latin food. So I, I love that, that experience with him. Again, I, I learned quite a bit. And then after, after that, I realized um, how important it was to travel and get inspired. So my travels played a big, a big part in, yeah. in creating and doing. I want to say that it shows, at least I think so in this book, you know, it sounds like a commercial, but I was, I enjoyed it because for us who cook a lot, it's also um, a story, a journey, which is like a business model. Sure. You, the yeah. travels did that. So what inspired you to say, Hey, I'm learning. I mean, you're becoming a, like a LeBron James while you're traveling. And then you want to shoot up to be become the LeBron James, the GOAT in, you know, your industry by applying for an Iron Chef. What made you say, I want to go to TV? That's like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, it's funny the way it worked out. Um, that opportunity came about because I had opened my first restaurant, Amada, in 2005, our Spanish restaurant. And uh, I just had been getting a lot of good um good press, some good accolades. People had started to say, hey, this guy from Philadelphia became a, a, a national uh, story. And so the Food Network reached out to me and they said, hey, would you uh, mind auditioning for the season of Next Iron Chef? So, um, so I went, I auditioned, I did not make that cut, but they said, hey, come back and uh, challenge Bobby Flay, which I did. And I and I won, and I was like, "Ah, oh, this is." What know, was it? Was it? Oh, I was on, oh yeah. What? What did? Uh, what was the iron? What was the the, the chief ingredient? Uh, battle melon. So we had a bunch of different melons: uh, honeydew, Crenshaw, watermelon. Obviously, and I brought brought my team up there, and we were we were at that time into uh, you know kind of molecular gastronomy and thinking about techniques, sous vide, foams, etc. And it was not. It was. I think it was just coming into play on Iron Chef. Remember, this is 2007 we're talking about. Uh, and so, yeah, we had some fun with it. Bobby wasn't ready for that. I'll just say that he was still, <laughs> you well, know. I'll, I'll tell you, you, you are, again, a chef who happens to be Latino. But for us watching you, we were rooting on kind of like the African-American community seeing Obama become president. <laughs> it really meant a lot because you can go to New York and you can go to Miami. And I always think that the Latino chefs in Miami and New York, because of the last name, get overlooked because of the French kind of still dominating the industry. So for us to see, and it was like Iron Chef. It wasn't like, you know, guy's grocery game winner. You didn't win that. 
you want yeah. the Iron Chef. No disrespect to Guy, but I'm saying for us watching you uh, become an Iron Chef and like, it was Bobby Flay, man. So it wasn't like you were beating the other ones, even though they're all talented. So that was an amazing experience. And, and so talk to us, you win and you become, what did that do for your fulfillment? And did it open up a lot more for you and your career? Yeah, I mean, I think um, when I eventually won uh, in 2009, I won the, the season of Next Iron Chef. That was just a pretty momentous, uh, I mean, a huge pinnacle, I would say, in my career. It's something I'm really proud of. And, um, you know, what it meant for me is, you know, I, I wore, um, you know, carried that flag, I felt like, for Latin cultures and representing Latin foods through this, this platform, you know, Food Network and Iron Chef. So all of my battles, most of them were really... Uh, you know, my focus was, okay, how do I bring Latin culture and Latin ingredients to, to this, this platform? So that was always like top of mind. I remember, um, I remember you explaining the dishes and you would say, I'm from Ecuador, this is ceviche. And you would use French techniques with Latin flavors. You really had to be the right person to represent us because you were classically trained, you were well-traveled, you were well-versed and you looked like us. So uh, there's a lot more behind what you're saying that what we saw, you know, it yeah. was an honor to have someone like you on a high, you know, platform talking to the, you know, kind of distinguished judges and to have that because I think you also did a lot for the culture, you know, um, Latin cuisine is dominated by the, the top three, the Mexicans, the Peruvians and the in the, in the Cuban and the Puerto Rican food. And I think it was great for you to, to mention those little words without even doing it on purpose. We caught on and it inspired you and Doug inspired me to do what you've done for your cuisine for Nicaraguan food, you know? So yeah. excellent. What, so, oh, yeah. so what happens? You win that and now all of a sudden everybody and their mother wants to do a collab. And, and so how do you take all that fame and, and compartmentalize it? Yeah, I mean, I think, when that occurred, it really created a lot, like a kind of a, a, I would say like a storm of opportunity. And it was like, really, okay, how do you, how do you break this down? And what we did was we looked at um, different parts of food and beverage. So it was, you know, restaurants, catering, and, um, you know, within those different applications, there's obviously uh, different disciplines as well. And I was looking, okay, how do I channel this in the right way? I think there were, let's say, opportunistic opportunities and then, and then more strategic. So if I were to give advice going forward, I would say, you know, really have your strategy and keep it, uh, try to stick to it as best yeah. you can. Because it's easy in those moments to feel like, oh my God, I've got so much opportunity, I'm going to do everything. And yeah. so it really... I think um, looking at strategy and, and I think our strategy was, was successful for some time, but yeah, you, know, like you get, you have pitfalls that, that happen along the way. Even, even Apple has new projects, products. So that's what you're doing, you know? And so yeah. I, I like what you said, strategize it and uh, seize the opportunity. Let's uh, touch a little bit on your, your affiliation with wine with J is that a uh, wine of passion of yours? What are you doing with JCV? Well, I just, you know, in, in creating chefgarces.com, I want it to be a uh, food culture hub, a place where people can come for, you know, whether it's music to listen to while you're cooking, uh, recipes, you know, a, a video content, you know, services, but wine is, you know, obviously like a, a great match for food. Yeah. So um, I was contacted by, um, Marnie Old, who works for JCB Wines, and she's a, a local uh, Philly person who's been in the wine business for a long time. She's a great, uh, she's a sommelier. I respect her a lot. And um, she's like, Jose, you know, I'm working for JCB Wines. We, they have a great uh, wine ambassador program that I think will match up well with what you're doing. Yeah. And so... Um, I just thought it was okay. This and it, it also again lends itself to the e-commerce world that's going out there right now. There's so many different 
affiliations right now that you can do in, in this in, in cyberspace. It's it's amazing. Cool. And so I think bringing that in, bringing that aspect to what we do, and it's just I, I we had an event last night. I just think the possibilities are endless for this. It really is like you know, 100%. I'm cooking. I'm doing Latin live, uh, guys. You know, with my dishes, I really love these particular wines. And you know, it's important that you pick a brand that you could stand behind. And I, I just, I tried their wines all summer. I'm like, this is this is a great match. Well, we wish you best of luck on that. Keep me posted because um, I like all these ideas that you're doing because it's it's showing that the resilience of who we are as business uh, people in this country, land of opportunity. Let's let's uh, skip forward to some fun questions. Your pet peeves of people dining at your restaurants. Oh, pet peeves. Uh, <laughs> let's see. You know, I'm I'm the I'm the guy that will allow like. I think the customer's always right, you know, that, that, depending on what they, <laughs> what they're, but you know, there's so many dietary restrictions and, and, and all these things. And that's fine. Like we have to take care of everybody right now, but I think uh, a pet peeve might be someone who's maybe making changes to the menu just to make changes, right? If you have a dietary issue, you have issues, it's fine. But you know, I think, uh, you know, so like my, <laughs> I'm going to, my wife's going to kill me, but she orders things like extra, extra well done. And I'm like, you could just tell them well done. I think that's okay. But if you're like making them go over the top, it's a little, a little too much. So just that little extra, you know, like don't, don't go all the way there. Yeah. Um, your pet peeves in society. Oh, <laughs> where do we you know, start? <laughs> you, you, know, you know me a little bit that you knew this was not going to be a typical uh, interview, you know? <laughs> you're, yeah. woke. you're too woke for me to be cutting, cutting short. Yeah. Yeah, no, no problem at all. No problem. I mean, there's, there's so much, there's so much going on there right now. I mean, I think right now, um, you know, the political environment has been, has been just uh, toxic yeah. for, for, for a long time. And especially with the election season uh, that just occurred. Uh, I just think, you know, socially, we all need to like find a way to get on the same page. And that might not be, realistic fully but at least establish some common grounds out there so that we can move things forward you know take socially the, take, taking the time to understand each other and i what someone told me is don't let your political party define you as a person right yeah, we can have we can have differences i i don't like certain dishes and it should be that simple that's your belief i'm not here to change you it's it's to understand so i i like that so did you vote in this past election I did, and I also, not only did I vote, but I put a, a mailer together for the Latin community because we were lacking behind. We spent 70,000 um, mailers encouraging people to vote and vote for, uh, vote for Joe Biden because I felt like he had the, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the best interest in, in, and, and amongst other things, amongst a, a plethora of other reasons why I felt Listen. like he was a better candidate. I, I applaud you for that because people complain about the politicians aren't doing anything for Latinos. Well, when we vote, then we become a, a force to be reckoned with, right? Sure. So right now, vote. I don't care who you vote, just vote so that then we can see our 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 movement in history, you know. And I'm I'm a proud uh, Republican who voted for Biden, just because no tax break is going to define like the social division and. Uh, you know, but I understand why people vote either way. And I try to understand whether I agree with it or not. So I, I like this conversation because I do want to show the viewers and society out there that we are not just people in food. I'm not just a fan of yours talking. I, I actually enjoy your vision on business and everything. Now, person dead or alive, who would you like to have dinner with? Person dead or alive? Uh, gosh, well... I would say, um, believe it, my my wife's dad, who passed away five years ago, uh, you know, he meant so much to her. I mean, she actually uh, still writes him a monthly letter, and we we actually get some some um, some interesting spiritual signals from his presence around. And mm -hmm. so he's someone. His name is Mark Mark Schmelzer, who. Um, who I wish I would have gotten to know better and gotten to yeah. spend spend some time with and really, you know, updating him 
like having just one night at a dinner and be like, hell, Mark, we've like, your daughter and I have had, we've had so much fun. We've, we've been through uh, so much just to kind of fill him in on, on all that, that we've done. Yeah. So, no, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I find that the, a lot of people I interview on this show, um, you know, the majority is a family member. And that's, that's really cool because most people you would think would say Warren Buffett or other things. And I like that about you. Last question, because I know you're a busy guy. If the world was ending, what would be the last dish you would request? World was ending, last dish. I think I might go with, um, and Armando, you may not know this about me, but I'm a, I'm a huge pizza fan. I love it in every different shape, <laughs> sizes. I, uh, you know, grew up in Chicago, as I mentioned earlier, and they have a style there called tavern style. It's, it's actually, uh, it's a misnomer that uh, deep dish is the Chicago stuff. It's actually, the tavern style is a super thin crust. It's a cracker crust that okay. allows you, they actually dry it out for four or five days and allows you to put a good amount of toppings. Just my favorite. And I would, I would love a sausage and pepperoni before. Sausage and mushroom, Italian sausage, I would be happy. I, next time I know, I'm going to get mad at my Chicago friends for never telling me about tavern style and always taking me to Malnati's. No disrespect to Malnati's, but I'm just saying. Well, that's good. <laughs> Pizza. <laughs> well, Chef, let me tell you, keep us posted on your success, um, your endeavors, because it's not just the flavors you put in us, but it's also the inspiration you create. And thank you for taking the time, man. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. All right, bye. Armando, be well, my friend. Salud. Right. Happy holiday season, okay? Likewise, check it out. We're gonna play some. Uh, well, let me see. Didn't play, but no for your playlist. <laughs> All right, my brother. Take care.